So I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Amir Amedi from the uh, University, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So Amir has been working uh, in uh, Jerusalem, in Boston, on a very important aspect of uh, plasticity in the visual system, but more importantly, how the, both the hearing and the visual system can uh, work together and compensate each other leading to uh, an integration and the possibility to compensate by one by each other. So we, it's very sending, but it's also very important for the future of visual rehabilitation. And I'm very pleased to uh, pass on the word to, to Amir, who is also a good friend. OK, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, uh, talking about plasticity in the human brain, lessons from longitudinal multisensory uh, studies. Uh, in case I don't make it to the end, I want to give the credit for the main people I'm going to present their work. Uh, several uh, uh, master and PhD students did up, Shachar Mandenbaum, Sami Aboud, Elastra Yamamit, and Lior Reich, uh, and some work of Ronnie Arbel. Some work in collaboration uh, with Jose towards the end, and uh, uh, some work uh, together with Stanislas Dian and uh, Laurent Cohen. Uh, I was asked to make a very quick introduction about the cortical uh, uh, processing of uh, visual input, which is a very dangerous uh, mission to do in front of uh, people like Brian Wandel, but I will try to do it for two, three minutes. Uh, so uh, basically, we have uh, input coming from our eyes. Uh, like in all the senses, we have uh, a, a transduction, uh, converting some physical uh, part of the, of the world into electric signals. It travels into the thalamus and then arrives to the cortex to a series of, uh, of, uh, of steps. The first station is uh, uh, this V1, V2, and the rest of the retinotopic areas, which uh, preserve some mapping of the external topography inside the topographical map inside our brain. And uh, it starts with analyzing very simple uh, relative simple uh, features like uh, line junctions and lines and so on and so forth. And then we have basically two main streams of, uh, uh, of uh, processing. Uh, one, uh, the, the what stream in which we uh, analyze and understand what is the shape and what is the color of things in front of us. Uh, and then we have the dorsal stream. Uh, both starts already from the retino retinotopic areas and go to non-retinotopic or high-order areas, uh, which uh, basically this uh, where or how stream tell us information, gives us information about the location of objects in the preparation of acting upon them. Okay, and we have different frame, reference frame there. And then we have several areas, high-order areas. I'm not going to mention all of them, but just several ones. Uh, which uh, show uh, additional specialization or cortical specialization or uh, the peak activity for a given uh, category or selectivity uh, is for these objects. One is this uh, LOC area, uh, the human homolog of uh, IT cortex in which represents objects and tools uh, found by, uh, in human by uh, Rafi Malach. Um, then we have uh, areas uh, which are actually quite surprising and found by Laurent Cohen and Stanislas Dian, um, um, built also on some neurological condition in which you can lose specifically the ability to read without losing your ability to see, for example, objects or to recognize them. And it's a very consistent area and there is a set of very interesting questions about uh, this area, and recently it was found by uh, Joseph Parvizi that there is a homologue in the right hemisphere, so this is in the left hemisphere, that is selective more to symbols, not of phonemes, but symbols that represent quantity, or numbers in other words. We have faces in various uh, areas, selectivity for scenes and, and houses and so on and so forth, and also uh, uh, more recently it was found that there is selectivity to our body, uh, besides uh, the head, a representation of visual representation of our body image. Uh, so this is uh, this is a you know a two two minutes overview of the cortical uh, uh, processing of uh, of uh, visual input, and there is some uh, open question I would like to uh, pose here in this context of uh, cortical uh, processing and of uh, 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 visual and auditory uh, uh, processing. 
Uh, so the open questions are the following. Is what, one question is, what is the origins of all these selectivities, as I mentioned here, in the visual system, uh, both in high order and retinotopic areas? Um, and uh, one type of uh, set of questions is, uh, is the famous uh, nature versus nurture debate, uh, which uh, we apply here for the question of selectivity and development of, of these pathways, of these selectivities in the visual system. Uh, the second question is, what is the role of visual input and visual experience to shape up all these specializations? This is the second set of questions. And of course, we are going to ask, uh, is there a critical period in the sense that uh, is there a point of time that we must have uh, of exposure to visual uh, stimuli in order to develop all these selectivities? Uh, a third set of questions, not all, all, some of the questions uh, overlap uh, to some extent, is to ask what is the evolutionary time scales for specializations. So for example, we have some categories like faces or like tools in which we had enough time in evolution for natural selection to operate and create this type of selectivities. On the other hand, when we talk about the highly consistent activity in different uh, uh, languages and in different people for reading or for these uh, numerical representations, uh, then we are talking about things that are less than 10,000 years, all of them, so we don't have enough time for, for uh, natural selection, so how do we have such a consistency across people with this type of selectivity? And finally, I'm going to ask whether these areas are visual at all. All this 30% of the brain or whatever, there is different <laughs> estimates, is it really visual in essence, or visual is the most compatible sense to uh, work with this, uh, uh, with this cortex? How much uh, vision have a critical role in shaping out functional specialization and the functional connectivity and anatomical connectivity in the visual system? So this is basically what I'm going to uh, ask in this uh, uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, of this talk. And uh, since we are already in the morning, maybe we would like to sleep a little bit more until the next talk. So I will already give you uh, the bottom line of the talk, of this talk. And I would try to convince you with some data, and it will be more an overview, so I won't take one study and get very deep into it, but try to do some overview of the recent couple of years of studies uh, in our lab and in several other labs. And I would try to suggest that all these specializations uh, including uh, retinotopic biases, can emerge to some extent without any visual experience. They can also emerge in people that had visual experience but learned to use and perform the same task in a different sensory modality. And this might teach us uh, about the origins of specializations. So uh, uh, I will return to this uh, summary slide in the end, but basically the bottom line is that the visual cortex principles of functional specialization an organization can develop without visual experience. So it's a pretty bold uh, uh, argument. So we'll see if we have enough data to support it. This can also occur in the normally developed brain to non-visual input in terms of hours or tens of hours, but only if the right cross-modal correspondence between the senses are learned. If we create a situation in which the other sensory modality gives you very similar information to what is given in, uh, uh, by vision originally, and we suggest that this novel task-specific sensory independent organization and plasticity is uh, driven by a combination of connectivity biases, that some of them might be innate, and sensitivity to task distinctive features for each area or network within the visual system. We will actually generalize it also to the auditory system, but probably a want of time uh, in this talk. So this will be the various uh, studies. So how can we check this type of question? What was the model that we uh, choose to, uh, 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 in, in some of the studies that we, we took? So one approach was to look on all the spectrum from people that had normal vision via all various types of visual deprivation. Uh, it can be a partial visual uh, deprivation, but I want, we have a couple of new studies on this uh, together with the uh, Institut de la Vision but, uh, and Jonas Elwood, but I won't pre present them today. Uh, and all the way to presenting, and this is what I will focus today, in testing people that didn't have visual experience. They were born blind or they are even uh, microphthalmic or never had their retina developed, okay? And using various imaging methods for uh, 
the average population activity, functional and anatomical connectivity, we can uh, uh, basically look at how the brain responds. And the last part of this uh, model is to combine it with the field of sensory substitution device. So what is a sensory substitution device? We suggest it's a very, very interesting model to study these questions because sensory substitution devices that were suggested originally uh, by uh, uh, Paul Bacharita, uh, in which we uh, recently uh, wrote uh, 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 neuroscience and biobehavioral review, a whole uh, 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 issue dedicated to uh, uh, work inspired by his uh, uh, ideas of sensory substitution. And the idea in sensory substitution that you basically try to take information that's coming from one sense and embed some of it using some type of algorithms in a different sensory modality. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that we see not only with our eyes, there is a whole interplay between the input that comes to our eyes and the processing that is done in the brain uh, that gives us uh, a rise to, to visual experience. Uh, so basically what Paul Bacharita said, let's do make a bypass. We'll take the visual input, we will embed it. We mainly use tactile sensory substitution. We will embed this information in touch. Uh, and then the brain will do the reverse mapping. Okay, so it will get this tactile stimulation, let's say on the tongue or on the, on the, uh, uh, on the different parts of the body, and it will understand what was the input image coming from the camera. Okay, so, um, so this is really uh, attractive because in a way we are having a topographic representation, and I would try to show you that you can even try and represent color, and the color of different ob objects, their identity, their location in space, so we are preserving a lot of what is vision is all about, but now doing it in a different sensory modality. Okay? So we can ask all this set of questions that I was uh, posing here. So I will give you an example of a very simple minimalistic. Uh, so also sensory substitution can come in different flavors. You can either have a minimalistic sensory substitution, a device that replaces only one of the aspects. So for example, Braille is a very famous example of sensory substitution, but it takes only one aspect from the entire visual world. It just takes characters and converts it into touch. Uh, this is a, a sensory substitution, a minimalistic sensory substitution we developed in the lab called the iCane, and basically um, it gives you information about only distance to obstacles up to five meters from you in one or in several directions. Uh, and what I want to show you that uh, when you take one component, it can be very intuitive. So in this case, I'm going to show you a movie about a, a congenitally blind that had uh, two minutes of experience with this uh, device that uh, transformed distance into vibrations. And basically, the mission is to go out of a maze. Okay? So you can see here uh, the congenitally blind. We have the student, in this case, uh, Daniel Robert Shabbat, was going after him. And you see that he's looking away. This is actually twice the real speed. Okay? But it's pretty pretty cool. He can get a grasp of their spatial organization of the environment to some, some extent and, and, and go out. Uh, and what is neat about this uh, 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 setup is that you can actually create a similar, so we created uh, this uh, array of uh, uh, big uh, Hebulio mazes, and you can create uh, the same environment in, uh, in the scanner in virtual environments. So basically what you see here is a, a study that we conduct now on navigation using the various senses that Shachar Mandenbaum is leading. Uh, you can see here that sighted, even without zero training, go in, and of course they can manage to find a way out and do it very efficiently. And you can see here when they get this cane and navigate inside a virtual environment that replicates these different mazes, uh, in their first encounter, uh, uh, they are stuck in the area of the of the starting point. Uh, so this is a heat map of where they spent inside the maze, inside the scanner, when we scanned them, when they didn't have uh, knowledge how to use this uh, cane. And then after they learned this specific maze, you can see that they found a way out. And you can see here, for example, the, uh, so uh, we did it uh, again on blindfolded, be uh, sighted before and after lear uh, learning, uh, congenitally blind, so without visual experience, and sighted. And you can see here some initial results, pilot results from this uh, uh, study, which shows very nice uh, uh, selectivity, actually, recruitment of the parietal cortex. 
But in addition to it, actually the peak of activation was in dorsal retinotopic areas. Uh, perif and this per peripheral dorsal retinotopic areas. There was actually deactivation of the, of the hippocampus. And what is really cool is that we also found some activation that overlapped with some, uh, uh, recently we took uh, the classic retinotopic uh, methods that were developed by uh, Engel and by Brian Ronudel and, and uh, Marty Serino, and basically applied the same uh, phase locking approaches to map the body representation. And you can see here very beautifully that, uh, so some of the homunculi, like Penfield homunculi, we have a very good idea what they do. And some, there is a nice correspondence with the animal studies, like this putamen uh, homunculi, and some homunculi were completely new. <laughs> and basically, what you see here is that there is a very nice overlap uh, between the navigation system and this body representation, and actually there is a selectivity to the middle and lower part of the body. So this is type of, uh, and you can see a very nice selectivity when they navigate in real maze versus scramble maze. So this is the type of work you can start doing with sensory, with, uh, uh, sensory substitution devices. But this is these minimalistic devices that only preserve one feature. What I'm going to do in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the auditory modality um, and on more holistic topographic uh, sensory substitution that try to maintain information, information in the entire image. Okay, so to get all these aspects of shape, color, and location. Of course, in worse uh, resolution, of course, it's difficult to learn it. It's much more cognitively demanding, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we choose the auditory modality because uh, we thought it's, uh, uh, first of all, it ha in principle, if you choose a, a, a um, temporal algorithm, you can actually create much more resolution. Because here, in the touch case, you're limited by the just noticeable difference by the two-point discrimination. So for example, in the back, it's about four centimeters. So you, even the, if you cover the entire back, you are limited with the number. So actually, here you can get to t thousands and even tens of thousands of pixels in principle. Uh, and also, what was really uh, uh, important to us is that it's super cheap. You don't need to create this, all these very expensive arrays of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, touch. And the last component, it's very easy to do in imaging experiments with it because it's basically you need to give auditory stimulation. Okay, so it's we found we thought this is a better setup to ask this question that I posed in the in the beginning. Um, so how do this? Uh, I'm I'm going to present to you a, a, a data from uh, a mainly from the iMusic algorithm that we developed. It have two uh, versions. One is a grayscale version, and the second is using exactly the same. Principles, but now with a, with a color, adding color information. But let's start with this uh, simple uh, example. So, if we had this letter V, yeah, and uh, I want to uh, uh, decode it in touch, so I will stimulate this uh, uh, electrodes. Okay. Now, what about if I want to do it in the auditory modality? So the idea is that we are going to have notes in a pentatonic scale. One pe white pentatonic scale. There is a beautiful. Uh, TED talk by Bobby McFerrin with some very nice demos showing how pentatonic scales are universal. It's a five minutes but beautiful uh, talk uh, that show what's the power of this type of scale. So if I'm going to hit, uh, if I'm going to hit high notes, I'm going to hear more soprano. And if the pixels are lower, it will be low. And if it will be lower then it will be the basis, okay? The base uh, sound. So basically we scan the image from left to right and the brain, the subject need to learn to do an integral over time. It starts with every three seconds, so it's a very slow motion vision, very, very slow motion. But the best subjects can get into one second and even half a second of refresh uh, rate. Uh, but usually they say within this range of uh, 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 one. Now I want, I, I, it's a more scientific uh, question uh, talk, so I'm not going to do a lot of demos. But usually, I I can show you that uh, in five minutes of training, after five minutes of training, I can already put you a word that you are not able to see. You are just hearing these musical sounds going in different directions, and about half of the audience managed to write down the word. So it's very intuitive. Uh, by the way, it's uh, very different from Braille in the sense in which. Uh, late blind found it extremely difficult to learn, okay? And uh, there is a big percentage that actually never managed to learn it. 
Um, and also we compare it, we will compare it in the end to visual prosthesis. This is also something that takes much more time and much more effort in visual prosthesis. So there is something about this type of topographic representation and these temporal changes that is very relatively intuitive. Of course, you need to devote a lot of effort to, to, to learn it, and I will show it in a minute. Uh, recently, we also developed a Bluetooth uh, a glove on the both hands, and the idea is that you can scan at the same time, the, the, you get the sounds or the touch. It can fit different type of blindness. It can help you to teach without. Uh, right now, we are very limited because somebody needs to teach them. So we now develop some games. We develop this tactile glove that you can learn from your own tactile experience, which is more uh, topographic in its nature, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm going to focus on this. Uh, uh, this is a representation. This is another example. So just let's uh, do a. a uh, one uh, minute of, uh, I won't teach you to read the whole word, I don't want to waste the time, but let's do a couple of letters. So uh, I showed you the sounds of the diagonal life. I want the letter V. How would this sound? You can, yeah, draw me in the hand. It's going down and then up, right? And then, so the scale going down, scale going up. Um, how about W? T U E U E. Okay. And M, it will be the opposite, and so on and so forth. Okay, L will be a very brief uh, sound that includes a lot of sounds, very brief, and then the low bass, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, uh, now how about uh, adding colors? So the adding colors is actually pretty simple. The idea was to we make some clustering into one of the uh, main uh, five colors, uh, red, green, blue, uh, and yellow, and uh, whitish with all their brightness level, and we simply replace if the pixel is white or grayscale, we keep this human singing, yeah? And we also know that we have uh, areas dedicated to analyzing voices of humans uh, and speci special specialization, not only to faces, but also to voices, uh, shown by Pascal Benlin. So this is why you choose it for the basic uh, algorithm. But if you have, for example, your hand um, here on the piano, so you can see the resolution, the original <coughs> image. This is the resolution of the iMusic. So this uh, keyboard will have a lowering, uh, descending sound uh, with, some, uh, uh, with some spectrum. And suddenly we hear the piano in a very low tones. And you would, if you are enough experienced, you can understand that this is your hand. And this is actually really nice, separating your body from the environment and interacting with it if you have some signal that gives you in a different musical instrument the body. We'll uh, talk later about this. So what do the blind can do with this? Uh, they can uh, learn to read the uh, text and numbers, of course, much slower than vision. Everything is slower than vision. Uh, object and object recognition, body images, numeral symbols, faces, and even faces and facial expression. Um, I will show you only one very short movie. Again, I don't want to waste time on the technology. I want to get into the, to the imaging and to the plasticity studies. But basically, they can pick up uh, uh, any of these bottles quite quickly or in the supermarket. They can look at, this, at the clouds for the first time or the first time in many years and recognize pattern or the moon or things like this. This is things they really enjoy doing. Uh, but they can also, after about 40 hours of training, learn to recognize facial expressions and even the identity of uh, um, famous people like Marilyn Monroe, which, which in some lower resolution you can still uh, record. So let's do a very quick movie about this. This is Hamutal. <clears throat> just a second, just to show you the setup. This is a Hamutal congenitally blind. You see here the camera. And this is Ella, which was leading the neuroimaging, uh, this neuroimaging study results that I'm going to show you soon. And now it's generalization to a new person. And uh, so uh, this is the basically uh, one example. OK, this was actually done with the, with the voice uh, SSD of uh, Peter Mayer, which is not including color, uh, for the face identification. Uh, we, we use the iMusic with all the color features and the color hair and so on and so forth. Uh, I won't get too much. Uh, I just 
want to mention, uh, so they can do a lot of really cool things that you will see, uh, uh, but I just want to have like an over-optimism warning. Uh, I think SSDs are a very useful tool and great for basic research, but currently they are not a valid replacement for vision as a standalone. Uh, there is some gaps. I want to say that we work on all these gaps and we start filling these gaps. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's an, uh, there are different issues like cognitive load, decent training, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is also no direct visual experience, although some, de uh, some develop that, uh, actually there is very interesting phenomena that we now study, in which you initially, for example, with the glove or with the sound, feel the, the object that you are looking at coming from your body or from your ears. And then you have a, a, a phenomena which is called distal attribution, in which you start perceiving the sensory input coming from your body or from your ears, but you start experiencing from the outside world. So it starts to be uh, uh, having the, these uh, abilities of vision to be a far sensing. Usually most of our senses, a little bit audition, but mostly uh, vision is our far sensing sense. So this distal attribution is when you start understanding that the information comes not from touch or from sound on your body, but from the outside world. And then some subject, but this is still uh, under debate and under investigation, starts, especially late blind, start to develop visual hallucinations when they interact with objects. So they would close the door and the door would jump to them and so on and so forth. So there, is, there might be also some beginning of visual experience, which is very interesting. There might be some ways, pharmacological or electrical, to, to boost these experiences, but this is a really open question. On the other end, with visual prosthesis, you, in the second you do the operation, even in the operation, you turn on the electrode, immediately you have visual experience. I will get back to this point maybe in the end of the, of the talk, but now I want to go back to this open question. What happened in the brain when blind or sighted learned to recognize objects or, or use these cate uh, various categories of specialization using SSDs? And what is the role of visual inputs and visual experience in shaping out this specialization? Um, <clears throat> but before that, I want to show you a, a little movie about uh, uh, the chronometry, the neural chronometry of processing uh, objects, reading a word, recognizing a face, recognizing a, a bottle uh, when they are inside the scanner. And basically what we did in the study, um, uh, and what is nice here is that it's really uh, quite replicable across uh, individuals. So I would present you a movie coming from a congenitally blind. And what you see here is the classical division of labor uh, that we have, this notion of visual cortex, of auditory cortex. So in red, we have this uh, auditory uh, visual system, ventral stream, dorsal stream. Then in the blue, we have this, all these areas that process uh, music, sound, language, and so on and so forth. OK, so this is the, basically the sensory, this looking at the brain as a sensory machine. There is, we have different channels, they go to different cortical areas, and this is how they process. Now, what uh, I'm, this, is going, this image is going to turn into a movie, but basically what we did in this type of studies is that we took these classical methods which used for a retinotopy mapping, in which you organize the world according to a given uh, principle of organization. So for example, in a retinotopy, uh, Brian Mundell and, and, and others showed very beautifully. So if you organize the stimuli coming from the fovea to the periphery, you get a whole map that represents uh, center to, to periphery. And the way you do it is you repeat it in a given frequency many, many times. And then you can do various analysis. For example, you can do a Fourier analysis, look at the frequency of, uh, uh, you can see here that there is a lot of power in the frequency of stimulation and then uh, very low power for the rest. And then you can add in, into these high power voxels uh, the phase information, okay? Uh, so this is how we used to replicate the pepenful homunculus and find this homuncula in the cerebellum and uh, insula and some other places, okay? But now we applied it for sensory substitution because actually sensory substitution object recognition is object recognition in slow motion. Usually we are, it's very fast. We finish to recognize an object in less than one TR, in one time that we covered the entire brain. So there is no point in fMRI to look at timing, okay? But actually here in case, uh, in this case, it takes them about four, five seconds to create the mental representation, this topographic mental representation in the brain coming from the sound. So actually you can have 
if you use TR1, you can have four or five points. And now you repeat it over and over again in a given frequency. So you get, and we focused here only on the auditory and visual system. And what you see here very nicely is that both the blue areas and the red areas are lighting up. So this is already telling us that actually, at least in the case of developing uh, without visual experience, but I will show you the same happens in, in, in the sighted, uh, both the auditory system and the visual system works in coordination. But actually the picture is even more interesting because what blue and red represent here is early in the processing and later in the processing. Okay, so the early TRs and the later TRs. And what's going on is that initially the sound or the interpretation of this uh, image or in movie in a second is that when we start to listening to the sound, let's say I'm giving you the letter W and I didn't tell you this is a W, just listening to it, or let's say do, how do they do this, the facial expression? If it's a smiley face, it will go, the rest of the face would stay the same, and then we have a line going, a sound going down and then up. If it's a sad face, it goes up and down. If it's indifferent, it's like this. If it's a surprise face like you saw in the movie, you will have one melody going up and the other down, or basically you will have a sad face and a smiley face at the same time. Okay, so you have two, okay, so if you understand it's difficult, okay, it takes time. This is why you need these 40 hours to get into facial expression. Uh, so what do we see in this movie? We see that actually what is going on is that it seems like that the brain is doing the reverse engineering of what we did with the sensory substitution. We took a colored image and embedded this information, topography, location, and so on and so forth, inside the sounds. Now the sounds go to the auditory system, A1, natural gyrus areas around it, maybe doing uh, some uh, quick Fourier analysis, so this is just speculation of the frequencies and the amplitude. But when we start to build the image, and in the time that we recognize that this is the word heel, or this is a face, or this is a bottle, then most of the activation is actually recruiting the most of the visual system. And mainly the ventral stream, but also of the ventral stream, and go all the way to V1. Okay, so it seems like that the brain is already telling us that uh, it's using both the, uh, the auditory and the visual system, but what is most interesting here in this movie is that actually the buildup of the topography in the brain of people that never experience visual experience or never had the retina is done ex exactly in the same place that we are doing this type of topography and color and so on and so forth. So this is, this is result number one. Now, the second thing we uh, moved on is to look at this uh, what, where organization. So basically what we did here was super simple. We took the classic experiment of uh, uh, Leslie Ungeleider and, uh, and, and uh, Mortimer Mishkin in NIH, in which basically they give the same pair, pairs of stimuli, but one time, you, you, but you have two different tasks, okay? So we, now we start to introduce the concept of task and specialization. And what, uh, uh, what uh, was shown in, in this classical uh, uh, experiments is that when you are performing a shape judgment about these pairs, they can be in the same shape or different shape, different, same location, different location. So when you ignore the location and, and focus on the shape, you get recruitment of the ventral stream and the vice versa if you do uh, localization. So basically we did exactly the same. And what you see here is the selectivity for, so, uh, what I want to emphasize is that the physical stimulation in terms of the auditory input in this case, or the visual input in case of the uh, Ungeleider and Mishkin experiment, is exactly the same. It's just a computation that you do on it. What is the judgment? What is the task? What is the computation you requested to do? And what we show is that both incited and congenitally blind, there is an overlap in ITS and in the precuneus. In the case of the ventral streams, actually go more posterior. In the other stream, it stays in high order areas. But there is a, a, in the peak of overlap, there is actually the same selectivity, both in blind, congenitally blind, without visual experience and sighted, of selectivity to shape versus location in ITS and the vice versa in the, in the precuneus and the, the uh, dorsal stream. A, a similar exper a experiment was done by the Alfonso Karamasset group showing that the animate in animate, there is some organization for animate in animate, it's, it's uh, there is a lot of debate of what is the source of it and so on, and so on but basically can be uh, replicated also in, in congenitally blind. 
So, <clears throat> uh, so far, I, uh, we talked about the general processing of the visual cortex and of the two streams. And now, let's move to these uh, areas that show specializations, okay? Uh, and I'm going to start with this uh, reading uh, uh, of uh, uh, letters and numerical symbols in the left and right visual word form and visual number form area. Uh, this area were initially, as I said, uh, reported by uh, Laurent Cohen and Stanislas Zidane. And basically, what they uh, um, try to argue is that letters and numbers are such a re recent cultural invention that natural selection could not shape brain areas for this very purpose. However, since they are showing a very precise localization in the occipital temporal cortex, in the ventral occipital cortex, what they suggested is that maybe what is happening here is how can they have a selectivity that pe people that uh, is reading in French here and across this entire hall and someone in China and Hebrew from the right to left, all of them have quite a very nicely selectivity in relatively very consistent uh, area. So what they suggested is there is some cultural, some cycling of uh, brain activity. These brain areas we know they actually part of the studies show that they are foveal, so they respond more to the fovea where we are using to read. So when we actually reading, we are jumping from in different places and, and, and read, only with, mainly with the fovea. And the second is that this area may be like line junctions, okay? So when we have a lot of line junctions in the different languages, so it was perfect to do this computation when now when reading one is invented, the brain went quote unquote, yeah, without consciousness, to the area that is most uh, close to this uh, invention and recycle it now to, uh, to do reading. And this is why it's, we have such a nice selectivity. Uh, but when we discussed that and uh, uh, I asked them, you know, we have uh, Braille, which is uh, used to read in a different uh, sensory modality. So there is no issue of fovea and uh, periphery. And also in Braille, there is no line junctions. It's all dots, and it's... So what, what do you think will happen? And they were actually really cool. They were very open to this uh, question. Uh, and basically, the result we got was really uh, very uh, strong and very surprising. Uh, just like previous studies, we found that there is activity in, vi in primary visual cortex. And there is a nice twist to the story and I, that I will get back to it uh, in the end, uh, or maybe I would mention it uh, now. Uh, but actually, the peak of the activation is falling exactly, you see here the peak of activation in the group of the congenitally blind. And this is the group results uh, of the cited, showing the most overlap and or the highest significance and less and less. And you see there is a very nice overlap in the peak. So they don't develop their own visual word from the parietal cortex and so on and so forth. So even if they never seen anything, and this text have nothing to do with light junctions or with, uh, uh, with uh, foveal uh, processing, it's still recruiting exactly the same areas. Now what was uh, even cooler is that we looked on the individual peaks of sighted reading by vision versus blind reading braille versus nonsense braille. So it's not an issue of the tactile input. The tactile input is the same. And actually, when we do, uh, we don't contrast them, but we look in both of them, there is a very strong activity in the hand area in S1 uh, and some other parietal areas. But when we look at the selectivity for reading, we get this activation. And you can see here that actually without tagging who was reading by, uh, someone was reading by vision, somebody by touch, and so on and so forth, you cannot tell if this was sighted reading by vision and, and blind by touch. Now, this uh, still didn't, don't tell us what, how can this selectivity develop in the tactile modality or in new modality. So what we did was the following uh, experiment. Uh, actually, when we started this experiment, we did not know anything about this uh, selectivity in the right hemisphere uh, for uh, num uh, numbers. Uh, but we designed the following uh, experiment. Uh, which have two components. One component was that we have a task, again, in which the sensory stimulate, uh, this time it's used the eye music, so this algorithm that I had, so another sensory modality. The second thing is that this sensory modality is being learned in a much uh, later age, okay? So this is learned uh, not in the age of six, but in the age of uh, 30, 40, and so on and so forth. 
And, uh, and basically, what the subject uh, had to do, they got uh, across the entire experiment the same stimuli, but each time, just like the shape location experiment, they needed to perform different tasks or different computation on this. And what you see here is that uh, the example of three uh, stimuli. So for example, we had in the numerical task, these symbols, uh, they needed to, uh, uh, to, to report on the quantity, whether it's five, or 10 or one, okay? In the letter task, they have to say V, X, I, and so on and so forth. And in the color task, they need to, to ignore this and focus on the color and report the color of the shape, okay? And in addition to it, we also have a resting state, uh, and now we are collecting also for the same task uh, DTI results. Uh, but let's focus first on the, uh, um, on the selectivity issue. And what you see here very, very nicely is that we can replicate the result we found on Braille using a new sensory modality that was learned later in life. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we also found for the a number task a very nice uh, overlap with the number form area in the right side, okay? So basically this is a replication and uh, uh, demonstrated the visual word form are, are reproducible across subjects and that the replication are not determined by feature of the stimuli in the visual modality there he appears to be a uh, metamodal in nature. And of course, it makes some sense because, for example, if you think about this thing, you know, a symbol, in one context, this is represent a phoneme, and in other contexts, it's represent the quantity. Now, the next thing we did was to look at resting state connectivity and look on, a, a, on basically on a method which is called partial correlation, in which you uh, take the seeds in one area and look and take out and re remove the variance that is coming from the other area when subjects are doing nothing. Now, what is the rationale of, of, of this resting state network? I won't have time to explore here, but basically it was shown that uh, uh, you can track connectivity between areas to some extent and even plasticity. So for example, the first study, the, one of the first studies in resting state connectivity showed that if you are doing a scan of resting state, then the subjects would train the hand or the feet and then you scan again, you can see changes in the, in the resting state activity of this area and also in the way that brain areas are coherent with each other at, at rest in, in low frequencies. And the bottom line of what we found when we did resting state on the sighted and on the congenitally blind is that actually the, if you take the seed area in the visual word form area, you can find increased connectivity in both the sighted and in the congenitally blind into the language system and the phonology system. On the other hand, when you go to the homologue in the right side, uh, also in the left side to some extent, but much more in the right side, you find connectivity into quantity and numerosity areas that are being represented in the parietal cortex. So if to summarize this set of results, I will skip this. Uh, so this is basically the method. And later we showed that uh, even you can actually reproduce retinotopy for example, the center periphery organization, if you take the resting state of sighted without being showing them anything, you would still get all the uh, connectivity between V1 and high order areas. But what is really cool in this brain study is that we show that even the, in the congenitally blind and even in microophthalmic patients that never developed the retina, still the retinotopic uh, foveal areas are connected to the rest of the foveal areas in the rest, V1, V2, V3, V4, and so on and so forth, even all the way to FFA, while the peripheral areas are connected to the rest of the peripheral areas. Now, just in a little twist, uh, uh, coming back to the Braille results, uh, recently we showed, uh, this is still unpublished, that if you go along the calcarine sulcus and look at the foveal part, the posterior part versus the anterior part, only in the left posterior part, the foveal parts, you get recruited by, by Braille, but the anterior part actually shows deactivation. So some type of center periphery organization like Chau by Logotetis, but now with reading Braille. And in the right side, you don't get any selectivity to, to Braille. So it seems that, uh, if to summarize the set of uh, studies, is that uh, uh, basically they suggest that uh, the specialization is, uh, the organization is task specific sensory independent, and we suggest that they are being created, if not by this foveal tendency or by this line junction. Uh, another take on this recycling theory would so be to suggest that the selectivity is being driven by two factors that are, some of them are innate. 
One is that there is bias co the bias connectivity principle, which suggests that there is pre-existing cortical, functional, and anatomical connection linking occipital cortex uh, various regions to the rest of the network processing this specific type of computation. Okay, so we are born with some pre-programmed connectivity that put some constraints on the develop of selectivity when we are now never have visual experience or we are now we have a new sensory experience in the sighted later in life and so on and so forth. The second constraint suggests that different patches or different networks within the visual system show different sensitivity to task distinctive features. So the, intrin the intrinsic properties of the circuitry of the visual system may be tuned to extract specific but invariant task distinctive feature of the object. So this together gives us uh, the explanation of how come we, we develop selectivity for reading. Now I have three more minutes, so what I will just uh, do is just give you a very, very quick, uh, oh, uh, actually just to finish this, uh, maybe it's better to do one and then just to summarize the rest of the selectivities. But as I said in the beginning of the talk, in a series of studies, we actually went selectivity by selectivity and showed that these two principles and this uh, selectivity can develop without visual experience and using this uh, 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 unique connectivity and distinctive feature of each uh, cortical area. I just want to give you one example, maybe I would finish uh, with this, if I have time, one more example from, from the body, um, um, of uh, some predictions that this theory has. So for example, the shape hypothesis predicts that expert more readers should not preferentially activate the visual world from area, because in Morse you don't have any shape, it's only temporal analysis. And, in this, uh, and indeed this is the case. But recently what we did, we took the Morse code and we created a new symbol that is almost like code, Morse, but have two features that are ventral stream in essence. A little bit of shape and a little bit of color to differentiate the colors. Uh, this, you, you can hear here this language, of vowel language. So basically each symbol is very, very brief and this is the slowest, so they can get reach very fast uh, uh, speeds. And they can actually, after 10 hours of training, they can read a whole tweet in less than a minute. And they can learn much faster than Braille. Uh, and also all the people that drop in Braille can go and, and still do it, and also cite it. So in, in, behaviorally, it's a very nice uh, method. And what we showed um, in several studies, this is actually from a different study, but basically this is just summarizing a set of experiments, is one that when you add these additional features, when you have both color which has come from timber and shape, the ability to learn and to read is much, much faster. So when you have redundant information for each uh, text, maybe it will tell us something about reading also. Maybe we can develop better systems also in vision, okay? Or multi-sensory system for reading also for uh, sighted. But the, I won't have time to show you all the, all the data, but basically what we did in this study was to take a group of congenitally blind or microphthalmic, also sighted, teach them only half of the alphabet, and then scan their brain for Braille and for uh, this uh, new font before they learn and after they learn. And what we show is that only the phonemes, and this uh, happened in two hours interval, so they don't know anything, we take them out, we teach them 11 letters, we put them in scanner again, and what you see is that actually they develop selectivity to this new modality in the ages of 30, 40, even we have uh, subjects at 60, in two hours, but only for the symbols that they know to do the transformation from symbol to phonology. Okay, so it's a very rapid, very dramatic selectivity that develops, but only to things that perform this task. Okay, so if you learn this cross-model correspondence and can do it efficiently, you will develop it. Uh, so the, I'm running out of time, so I would just show you, the, so this, this is a object recognition in LO and by sounds. Uh, maybe I would just, uh, the, the, you can show causality, uh, we didn't, uh, this is just anecdotal, but we can actually uh, have them recognize an object, then zap their, uh, this together was done, uh, study uh, together, uh, sending the imaging result of this specific uh, subject into Lotfi Merabet and Alvaro Pasua Leone. And basically, ten, ten, uh, you do recognition of an object, uh, then you do 10 minutes, one hertz TMS, to depress exactly the area that is, was activated by objects. And what you would get is their loose, uh, so. Object is detected. 
protected. Tape. Yeah, and now she would go to the 10 minutes uh, one hertz TMS. No connector. No she come back and she explore it. I want. I would save you the time, but she cannot even find the location of the objects. There, there is washout, and then she can do it again. Okay. So the last uh, one minute, and then I would summarize, is uh, showing you the same for the uh, ex visual exostride body area. What you see here is the mirror system uh, found by Uzulati. It's a system that shows basically the same uh, activity in the neuronal level for when you are performing a movement and when you are imitating the same movement. So it was suggested to play a very important role in uh, learning, in Im imitating. So if I now oper open my cell phone, I press the home button, so my kid look at me, and using the mirror system would do the same. And this is very well preserved in evolution, uh, as I show you in a second. But what I want to emphasize is that most of the input to this system comes from this type of uh, areas like the visual exostrite area, so it's mainly a visual input that we are using usually in our daily life to use the mirror system and imitate and learn and so on and so forth. So what happened in the congenitally blind when they don't have it? But just uh, to show you that how it's well preserved, there is some images showing how well preserved this mirror system. You can see here this, uh, even kittens can do, uh, <laughs> imitate the movement. Uh, Yeah, and it's so well preserved in evolution that even humans can do this uh, type of mirror uh, uh, thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a very serious scientist, so I went over the entire animal kingdom and found one example which is uh, not working. <laughs> But uh, like uh, any good scientist, I will uh, just ignore this example. <laughs> but what I want to show you is that now congenitally blind can learn to do the same thing. So this is again Hamutal, congenitally blind. She hears some soundscape, and now she would imitate it. Okay, and now we repeat it in the scanner with this and other categories. And the picture we get is very similar to what we get in the exostrite uh, uh, body area. This time, not in the visual warsome area, with the selectivity to the sounds without visual experience. So what, uh, this is the last uh, slide, the visual, so I try to uh, uh, summarize that the visual cortex principles of functional specialization and organization can develop without visual experience. It can also occur in normally developed brains to non-visual input in hours or 10 or hours if the cross-modal correspondence are learned. And we suggest that this type of uh, task-specific sensory independent organization uh, and plasticity is driven by a combination of connectivity biases innate and sensitivity to that distinct feature of each area or network, okay? And maybe this was also we, uh, combined with uh, uh, some ideas uh, that Alvaro have of metamodal organization in which you have multisensory neurons in small quantities in each area that might be the, the driver for, for this. So this is all the papers and examples. You can uh, download them. And I would just say that this also suggests that if this is their organization and this is their ability to perform plasticity so quickly, so maybe by combining this type of multisensory setup in which you will have visual stimulations with your prosthesis, some glove that will give you touch information and some sound, you can actually do the rehabilitation of prosthesis patients much quicker and much more efficiently, maybe coupled with some, some drugs that would enhance uh, uh, the experiences or, or the plasticity and so on and so forth. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention, and this is the last slide. Thank you.